the outcome of those three things will inevitably be less independence for Georgia civil society, less critical voices, fewer opinions that people will listen and find credible that will be uncomfortable for the authorities. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. Over the past several weeks, hundreds of thousands of people in the Republic of Georgia have taken to the streets to protest against a law making its way through Parliament. The law would force many NGOs to register as foreign agents. The law is modeled on similar measures in Russia that led to the near whole-scale criminalization of pro-democracy and human rights civil society groups. This move in Georgia's parliament is being pushed through by a political party led by an oligarch who made his fortune in Putin's Russia. It is also happening at the same time as Georgia is seeking to establish closer ties with the West and join the European Union. On the line to discuss what this law actually says, how it may impact Georgia's future and human rights inside Georgia is Denis Krivoshiv. Deputy Director for Europe and Central Asia and Amnesty International. We discuss the politics driving this law as well as what we know from Russia's experience with a very similar measure intended to curtail the independence of NGOs and civil society groups. As always, thank you for continuing to support this show by sharing it with your friends and colleagues by listening to our episodes, and of course, by reaching out to me. And you can always get in touch with me using the contact button on globaldispatches.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and become a paying supporter of our show. We depend on a degree of listener support, so thank you. Now, here is my conversation with Denis Kravoshiv, Deputy Director for Europe and Central Asia at Amnesty International. So, Dennis, thank you so much for speaking with me. To kick off, can I have you explain what this foreign agent law says? The law is commonly known as foreign agent law, and that's because it's modeled on the Russian foreign agent law, but it's titled slightly differently in Georgia. It's called a law on transparency of foreign influence. And the title is quite cunning. But essentially, any independent organization which receives more than 20% of its budget from foreign sources will have to register itself under this label and use it publicly. Failing to do so will result in severe penalties. So many NGOs have already said they will not comply with the law or cease to exist, but they're not prepared to use this title, this label, because it's designed to undermine their credibility. It's a smearing attempt by the government, and NGOs are not prepared to follow it. Are there specific NGOs that this law is going to be targeting? Like when the people who wrote this law were crafting it, did they have an idea in mind of the kinds of NGOs that they were seeking to label with this kind of moniker? I believe there will be some NGOs that the authors of this legislation have in mind. Now, it doesn't obviously specify them, and it will be, in theory, targeting everyone equally. But the problem for the Georgian authorities at the moment are those independent NGOs which don't need to worry about government funding, hence reliance on foreign funding, as where the most sources for such work come from, and which are the government's vocal critics. And there are quite a few. They come, they work on human rights, they work on a number of issues. They are a problem for the government, and this is the way to deal with them. So this law is the project of the Georgia Dream Party, which is led by Bijna Ivanishvili. 
Who is he and how did he become such a force in Georgian politics? Bidzina Ivanishvili is a Georgian businessman, an oligarch who has made a fortune through his businesses. Some of these are linked to Russia. That's where quite a lot of speculation is. What is his motivation for seeking some of the measures he is through his government? But we need to be also careful there. It's clearly understood by everyone in Georgia. He is the mastermind of quite a lot of what's happening. But his nominal title is honorary chairman of Georgia Dream. And of course, publicly, there are other people at the head of the party. But he is that all influential figure, which seems to be taking quite a lot of decisions. Yeah. And he seems just like a very interesting character. I mean, I've been to Tbilisi. He has this just like massive compound uh, overlooking Tbilisi that, you know, kind of gives off vibes like that of a Bond villain. And he has like this exotic animals, apparently even like a pool full of sharks. But he does seem to be the one pulling the strings behind the scenes, even though he is nominally the honorary chairman of this party. That seems to be the case. That's common assumption. I have no reasons to doubt it, but it's not a human rights issue as such. So as Amnesty International, we won't comment on this, but it's important to understand what's happening and why and who are the key actors. And he's certainly a very central figure to quite a lot that's happening. So in the weeks, if not longer, leading up to the passage of this law, there were really big protests in Tbilisi against the law. How would you characterize the protests and who was out there on the streets? And what was the government's response? There were indeed quite impressive protests, which we also saw last time similar legislation was proposed. And at that point, these mass people's protests in the capital, Tbilisi, resulted in the legislation being withdrawn. But clearly, this time, the government was determined to push it through enjoying its majority in the parliament. The people who join the protest probably come from all walks of life. Certainly, there's a, the opposition party presence. There are various civil society people. How do we know? They're the ones we often talk to, and many of them are in the crowd. And probably quite a lot of people who are just generally concerned about what's going on in Georgia. I think this particular piece of legislation has resonated with many that some fundamental freedoms are about to be taken from them. But there's quite a lot of dissatisfaction in Georgia with the ruling party, and I think that's what found its way through to the streets. Incidentally, so we've seen weeks of protests. We've seen a lot of government violence towards them. They deployed the police, and clearly the police were under instructions to be quite severe. So they tried to disperse. They used a lot of unlawful force. And I'm, it's a big term, but I'm using it very consciously here because what we do as Amnesty International, we do look at how the right, in this case, to peaceful protest, if it can be enjoyed or not, if there are any obstacles, and these were severe. And the way the police were handling this was way beyond what are the restrictions, the boundaries with which police must act. They targeted people indiscriminately. There were pockets of violence, usually provoked by the police themselves, but they used the force deliberately very widely, and many people got hurt. And that's an important part of the story here. And this story is not over, nor is the story over with the, this piece of legislation, because it still needs to be signed by the president. And my understanding is that the president is vehemently opposed to the law, and she will veto it. But because Georgia Dream enjoys such a majority in parliament, they will override that veto fairly easily. That's indeed what we all expect to happen. The president has indicated she's opposed to it. She indicated her intention to veto it. But the ruling party has said very clearly, if that happens, we'll take it back to the parliament and we'll push it through. And they have all the numbers they need for this and the procedures and the law on their side. But again, the battle is not over. And as we've seen, the government withdraw the, this legislation last time in response mostly to public protest. This time it's the public and the demonstrations were perhaps even bigger, but also there was quite a lot of foreign critical voices telling Georgia and its government of quite significant consequences if this piece of legislation is adopted. And one of those was a top official for the region from the State Department who, my understanding is very explicitly told Georgia Dream, he, he tried to meet Ivanishvili but was not permitted, was rebuffed, said, you know, you have a choice to make. You have 
all these millions of dollars of potential U.S. development assistance and U.S. aid hanging in the balance. Indeed, I've seen this news. The Georgian authorities' response was quite worrying, but it wasn't surprising. Previously, I mean, this is not the first instance in the recent years when things done or initiated by the ruling party have raised concern, including, for instance, in the European Union, which, of course, Georgia has declared its intention to seek membership of. And there were moments when EU stepped in and with very clear messages that certain actions would have negative consequences and that did not deter the government in the past. So it's quite worrying. Their determination to push this piece of legislation through seems clearly to ignore the fact that Georgia will have to face economic, political, diplomatic and other consequences. So if you go to Tbilisi, you know, you'll see EU flags flying aside Georgian flags in front of government buildings. There's clearly this huge aspiration, particularly among the people, to join the European Union. Yet this bill that's being pushed through clearly flies in the face of key principles of the EU and would be a real barrier to Georgia's ascension to the EU. So how do you square that contradiction? You have this party, Georgia Dream, that has control of parliament, yet you have this huge popular support for Georgia's EU membership. How do you reconcile those two things? I'm not sure these things entirely reconcile, but clearly the government has its support. Now we can ask ourselves questions why they have quite a lot of popular support, but it seems that they do, because the last few elections they came out clearly with an upper hand. And I suppose the people who want Georgia to join the European Union are not the same ones who vote for them. It's likely these are the people who were in the streets protesting, and there are many of them. But whether that's representative of the majority of people in, across Georgia, that's a big question. And I think we'll only know the answer to this in October. It would seem logical to expect that the outcome of next election may be very different to the past ones. But who knows? Again, as a human rights organization, we're not particularly well placed to know what people think and how they will vote. But certainly the level of dissatisfaction with the authorities among those who have previously opposed it is very significant. So let's see where it leads us. So that's interesting. There is a election in October, and it's possible that this election could really be a referendum on this foreign agents law. I think if we use the term of referendum, it'll be a referendum on a lot more. This law has been the symbol of quite a lot of things happening, and I guess the prospects of EU membership are among them. Georgia's intention and willingness to respect, well, the Georgian authorities respect international human rights obligations is another one. It really is about Georgia's future and where does it see it? And clearly, This law is modeled on the Russian law, and even that Russian name is used for it. And actually, many people call it Russian law for a good reason. That's where the idea of it was borrowed. Georgian authorities will seek closer relationship with Russia and their indications towards it. I guess that's the election when we will know which way it will eventually go. I mean, that's really interesting to me to hear. I mean, Russia currently occupies a good chunk of Georgian territory, and It's interesting to me to see that the October election might be, in fact, a referendum, among other things, on Georgia's future, either with the EU or or with Russia, just kind of harkens back to Ukraine in many ways. I won't ask you to comment on that as the representative of a human rights organization. Instead, I have a human rights question for you. So you said earlier that this new law really has the potential to undermine or erode fundamental freedoms in Georgia. Can you just explain the process in which that backsliding might potentially occur should this new law go into effect? Yes. We, Amnesty International, we consistently say this law is going to undermine the right to freedom of association. How this will work, for starters, the law aims to essentially smear the work and opinion and the actions of independent civil society organizations. That's very clear. To be independent, you need funding. In Georgia, where internal funding is quite limited, that comes from abroad, 
foreign funding, rely on it, you are independent, but you will have to label yourself with the wording which is intended to make you less credible and more suspicious in the eyes of general public. And this is what government wants. It's very clear the intention of this legislation, and we've seen this happen in other countries, including Russia. Once this happens, NGOs will be faced with a difficult choice. One is try and not rely on foreign funding. That's difficult. And if you do so, quite a lot of the time, in many contexts that are similar to Georgia's, that may mean to have to compromise with the authorities. They may not be the direct funders of some of NGO work, but they have means of influencing it, which would reduce ability to rely on domestic funding. But generally, it's not. Again, foreign funding is the main source. So reducing that would be problematic. Then the next choice is either comply and label yourself in this way, which, as I said, is the way to smear NGOs' work, or just stop work. And the outcome of those three things will inevitably be less independence for Georgia's civil society, less critical voices, fewer opinions that people will listen and find credible that will be uncomfortable for the authorities. But if we go by Russia's example, and this, it seems that the Georgian authorities they really intend to follow it, this is only the starting point. In Russia, the foreign agents law was adopted in 2012. Since then, it has been changed multiple times. Initially, the government used the rhetoric that there's nothing sinister about this law, that its only point is to make the work of civil society organizations transparent. Clearly, there was no need for that. They already report quite a lot where their funding comes from, what they use it on, etc. And it's all in the law. The whole point was to smear them publicly. But the rhetoric was that's not the intent. And these NGOs will never feel any other pain other than having to use publicly that label. That was lies. There were severe penalties. There was onerous reporting, which, by the way, will also hit immediately the Georgian civil society. But also over time, the scope of the law was extended and limitations were introduced. Those NGOs which had to label themselves as foreign agents were first prohibited from filing observers in elections, then something else, and so much. And over time, that went very far beyond the initial letter of the law. And then they extended it to individuals. And presently, it's a very, very effective tool in Russia for keeping people quiet. That's the logic of events of this legislation. But in Georgia's case, there's a further worrying point. The government has already indicated its intent to borrow other examples of legislation. For instance, one that is seeking to target the LGBTI community. So there was a suggestion that Georgia will also consider law, which the equivalent of which in Russia is prohibiting public discussion of what they call non-traditional values. So all of this in total suggests the purpose of this is to silence the government's critics, and it's not going to stop there. So in the coming weeks and months, I mean, you mentioned the October election. Are there any indicators or inflection points, or what will you be looking towards that will suggest to you whether or not On the one hand, the trajectory you just outlined, like the Russian model, advances, or on the other hand, you know, civil society kind of strikes back and is able to halt this democratic and human rights backsliding. There's a few things. And um, I mean, we've been talking about this law so far. I mentioned that the police was highly abusive. A key thing that needs to happen for all this unlawful use of force by police, specific people need to be identified as responsible and brought to accountability in trial proceedings. So how the government deals with the very fact that it has been just now in front of cameras of our eyes, very, very abusive to its own people, is another important indicator. We as human rights organization will not remain silent. And for us, the story is not over. Even if the protests go away, we will keep insisting that we've seen abuse. And for this, we want accountability. And clearly, the period until October is quite important. Now, you wouldn't expect these authorities, which essentially have taken steps for the police to behave in this way towards people, will now take steps to keep police accountable. But that's where next wave of public discontent may be about. So we've seen the logic of protest. If there's a critical mass of people, particularly in capital cities, who are prepared to protest and who are not deterred by police violence, and we've seen exactly that in Georgia, 
Well, who knows? There may be further protests, and next time there may be other issues. But quite what will happen, I can't predict. Plus, of course, we mentioned the president will need to either veto the law or (laughs) sign it, although clearly that's not her intent. So let's see what happens around that point. And when the government will bring the law back, the, the bill back to parliament, likely, to overcome the presidential veto, that's probably another pressure point. And I would expect quite a lot of return to the protest at that point. Dennis, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.